Good morning. And thank you, Dan and uh, video crew and musicians. It's great to see you all. Uh, bienvenidos a todos. We welcome you to Ainsworth United Church of Christ. And I invite you to uh, make sure that you are muted and hang in there with us. A number of announcements to lift up. Uh, first of all, if you don't have your communion elements, you might take a little bit of a moment uh, sometime in the next few minutes to get them. So you'll be ready for that in, at, towards the end of the service. I also need to thank, <coughs> excuse me, thank the musicians, especially the singers, Cynthia uh, Butts and Marvin Lynn today for their flexibility and willingness. Uh, we were all expecting the music from the opera that had been prepared for Black History Month. And unfortunately, we didn't find out till the middle of the week that they were unable to get the copyright uh, permission to, to stream it. So we were not able to use it. Uh, Cynthia and Marvin have jumped in and said they will do two weeks of music. So we are double blessed. And I am thankful. I apologize for all the copies of uh, the order of worship that came out to you, because I think that AI, um, AI was plotting to, to upset our, our worship service, and that's artificial intelligence, meaning my computer and me. But we finally sent out, I think, the correct one this morning. Regardless, the liturgy is all the same. The, the music that we're singing is the same. The music that changed was what Cynthia and Marvin were going to do today. So I'm very grateful to them and the video crew uh, and Dan and Diana, our musicians, accompanists for their grace, their patience and their flexibility. We are blessed. We are truly blessed. I also want to alert you um, at the bottom of the order of worship, whichever version you got, there is a weekly calendar. And we have two big events coming up this week uh, for Black History on Wednesday evening is the Theolo Theolo Liberation Theology and the Church Group. And Reverend Dor Dr. Dorsey Blake is coming back with us. He will be speaking about Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman, who was a great, profound theologian, uh, mystic, spiritual person, author, uh, just a, a, a very big presence for many decades. And we are blessed to have Dorsey Blake with us again. So that information will go out once more before Wednesday. In addition, this Saturday, we have our own Black History in the Making Man, um, but Dr. Marlon Broussard, who is a member of our church, a beautiful voice to sing with, but also a very, uh, very accomplished pharmacist for Legacy Emanuel. And he will be presenting to us, and you've received information about this, you'll receive it again, uh, this Saturday at one o'clock, his, uh, his perspective on the process for getting the COVID vaccine. And he's very much in, in the middle of it and working hard uh, to help people get vaccinated. So he will be a great resource to us on Saturday at one o'clock. So we hope you can join in via Zoom for that too. In addition, we, uh, I wanted to let you know that I am, I, I got accepted to a group uh, of clergy. It's a clergy renewal flourishing, uh, flourishing leadership, it's called, quite a long time ago. Originally, the program was to use study leave time uh, for a several uh, re retreats. Three, two to three day, three to four day, I think was the original plan. And of course, long ago, they were planning to be in person. We're not now, obviously. But I will be on retreat, so to speak, this Monday afternoon to Thursday morning. 
Uh, if there is a, a dire emergency, I can be contacted easily because I'll be at home <laughs> on retreat via Zoom. But otherwise, I wanted you to know that, that the office will still be going on and people will be available. Reverend Cecil is available this week and so forth. So I just wanted to let you know that is coming up, my first scheduled uh, re a group of retreat for that group. And finally, we have a special uh, preacher today, and she was requested by our Liberation Theology group last summer. She and, and they also had requested Janine Gates, who did preach in the fall. Salome and I had trouble connecting and, and planning a date that would work for the church and for her, but she has been very willing and and ready to step up. She, you did hear her during the Stewardship Sundays, do, giving a witness, I believe. And uh, today you will hear her as our preacher for the day. So we, for those that don't know Salome Chimuku, she has, she's grown up in this church. Her family, her parents and brothers, all older, uh, came from, from uh, Angola via Zambia uh, in the re refugee camp to the United States. Salome was the only member of her family to be born here in the United States. And uh, they, they were brought over, her family, the Chamukus were brought over by a Mormon church and hosted here, but her grandparents were brought over by, sec by Ainsworth United Church of Christ. So once they did their time and responsibilities with the, the Mormon church, they came to Ainsworth. So Salome grew up in our church. We are very excited to have her. She helped get going the Black uh, Resiliency Fund that many of you have heard about. She has done a lot of work uh, statewide as well as local and has done a lot in justice and witness. So we are excited to hear her today as a sermon, the speaker for our Black History celebration. So now I invite you to breathe deeply and let's center ourselves for worship. Thank you, Pastor Lynn. Good morning, Ainsworth, and happy Black History Month. My name is Fred Smith, and I will be your liturgist today. We sit on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Catlamith, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalabuya, Mulala, Bands of Chinook, and many others who made their homes along the Columbia River. We honor the members of over 400 tribal communities who live in the Portland metro area. We also want to acknowledge the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and of Latinx farm workers who have risked so much and received so little. They have all helped to build the wealth of this country. Please take a moment to honor the people who continue to resist and survive despite the intentional and ongoing attempts to destroy them. Please join me in the invocation. Merciful God, as we gather for worship, we pray for your mercy and forgiveness to be upon us. Sometimes we come with anger and bitterness in our hearts, but we are reminded by your prophet Martin Luther King Jr. that we can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. So we come to you asking for your Holy Spirit to be upon us, cleanse us, prepare us to receive your word and your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Our opening hymn is number 41, I Thank You, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving God. For you brought me, yes, you brought me from a mighty, a mighty long way. I thank you, Jesus. Thank 
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, my Savior God. For you brought me, yes, you brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. You've been my mother, Father. You've been my mother. You've been my sister, my brother too. For you brought me, yes, you brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. You've been my father, been my mother, been my sister, my brother too. For you brought me, yes, you brought me from a mighty, mighty long way. Thank you. And Mel Lindsay is back with us. I hadn't realized she would be here until the last minute today. So it's great to hear her voice as she leads us in, um, in some of the hymns. So I invite you to breathe in deeply that healing Holy Spirit and breathe out giving up to God all your burdens, all your cares as we center ourselves for prayer. Breathe in that Holy Spirit. We have a list. I again, thank God for all our musicians and how, what a blessing it is to have music, even during in this pandemic when it's very hard and it's challenging and risky. I give thanks to, for all of them. We lift up Cecil. So join with me as we pray. Merciful God, we gather faithful people, grateful and in thanksgiving for the ability to be connected. We lift up and praise your name, O oh God, because you are great and oh so good. And loving God, we have been in a long process. Some who've been down the road of fighting racism for centuries through their ancestors till now, some now fighting racism and injustice, but also trying to deal with the pandemic of COVID-19. And loving God, we pray that you rain down upon us grace and mercy, give us strength and patience to carry on as we seek to to be your people and we seek to respond to your call, help us to get through these days and all days. And gracious God, you have heard the names of so many people who have been lifted up for prayers to be surrounded, both in thanksgiving and in and please for healing and strength, for help and support during these hard, hard times. Loving God, you know what is needed even before we speak it. We thank you, God, for receiving all our prayers, spoken and unspoken. And gracious God, as we lift up prayers for our community, we also lift up prayers for our world. We pray for all those who are suffering from the COVID-19 virus. We pray for all those across the world who are awaiting for a vaccine. We pray that vaccines will be supplied for everybody. We also, dear God, pray for all the refugees, all those who've had to flee their homes for their health, for their safety, for survival. Gracious God, may they find hospitality and welcome wherever they land. And loving God, we pray 
we pray for our earth that has been battered about and and that which has been violated because we reaped what we did not sow. We pray for healing for all of creation. Gracious God, we lift up these prayers as we continue to pray for patience and strength. We lift the, our prayers as we pray the prayer of our Savior Jesus who taught us how to love and pray saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done <clears throat> on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's my favorite time of service. Good morning, girl. Good morning, children. I'm going to look and see if it, who all is around. I see the Broussards. Hi, is that Nadia? I don't know. Enola, I see them. Who else is here? Jania is here. Great to see you. Who else is here? Whoops, I think I caught somebody. Nope, that was not a child. Um, Leticia's daughter and I'm drawing a blank on her Beatrice she is here or that was Beatrice okay the name changed I got it B it's good to see you uh, Leticia's daughter is here or daughters um, hi and let's see anybody else it's great to see your smiling faces and I want to ask you do you know what special month? It's February and it's my birthday month. That makes it special. But there's something that's even bigger than that. Oh, and there's Isabel. I forgot she's back. She's here for a bit. What month is February? What special month? Nola? 
Black History Month. Right, Black History Month. And we celebrate that, not because Black History only belongs in February. And we do celebrate Black History throughout the year, but we especially take time to do special celebrations uh, during this time. And, the, and um, so I have something special that someone shared with me that I wanted to share with you. It is cool and it reminds us of what this month is about. Um, but I also, before we see it, I want to remind you that you are part of Black history, that we make it as Ainsworth and that you have a part of that. And, we, and there's Joseph, it's great to see Joseph. And that uh, we have seen uh, the weeks in January, we saw uh, young people as well as older people making history. We can all make history, no matter what our color is, no matter who we are, we can do history making things, good things. So I want you to give your attention to the screen, please. And let's see what David Nichols has for us because he's prepared this video for um, that I sent him to show. So go hit it, David. Quite something. 
Chuck's our Curtis Cole Transportation. You can be the University President, Model Feature of Your Nation. You can be a V video game designer or Xbox and PlayStation. You can be a W web developer. It's an online occupation. Now take that X. You can be an online with impact on the world. And with that Y, you can be an auto boss. Tell me, boy and girl, and with that Z. Z is the strive, you can reach the sky if you try. Just don't be a Z, just don't be a zombie. And let the world pass you by. That was quite a presentation, right? Uh, thanks to Beth Poteet for sharing that. It came at the perfect time. Thank you, children, and uh, listen to the music that's coming up, and then Reverend Cecil will get you into Sunday school. Thank you all. In the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers died? have come over a way that with tears has been watered oh we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out of the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of a bright star is cast god of our weary years god of our silent tears thou who hast brought us thus far on the way thou who hast by thy might let us in 
Cynthia and Marvin, thank you so much for that. The epistle reading for this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might may share in its blessings. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> As stated earlier, my name is Salome Chimuku. I am a long lifetime member of this church, um, even though I may not look like a familiar face to some of you. <laughs> um, I am blessed and honored to be asked to do the first sermon of Black History Month. And I say this in respect to the influence this church has had and also its members in terms of black history. Um, it has been an interesting time for all of us. Um, I will say that the verses that you just heard were chosen on purpose by me um, because what I would like to speak to you today is about emotional intelligence. Uh, for those of us who are not, um, how can I put this, in a place <laughs> where we uh, do diversity and equity work almost every day, emotional intelligence is the ability to be in one's privilege and hear the words of those who are oppressed and take them into our hearts. And that is a self-definition that I give. What you'll hear about emotional intelligence from most is that emotional intelligence is the ability 
to understand that when people are speaking their truth, when people are speaking their lived experience, that it is not a personal attack upon yourself. All of us have the ability to have emotional intelligence. Whether or not we rise to that occasion is up to us, but we have the ability. I speak about emotional intelligence because it is something that is necessary in our efforts, in our work, to make equity no longer a word, but an actual realization. I chose this specific scripture um, out of the lot I was given because I think it's very important for us as Christians, however we define it, to recognize that the church has not always been a safe space for all. To recognize that the same God that we all worship has been used as a tool to oppress those around us. And I say that to you as a queer black woman. Both of the communities in which I am visibly a part of have been shunned out, casted out, and oppressed using the same scripture that we go to for solace and peace. Both of those groups have been oppressed and has been told by others that this scripture justifies the cruelty that they have been dealt. And it's, it's an unpleasant, unpleasant place to be, to be honest with you. It took a long time, for me even personally, to recognize that the same groups that I belong to have had been dealt so much cruelty and hurt in the name of our Lord. It's a really weird place to be in when you are told, go to the Lord for peace. But also, that Lord is the reason you're oppressed. It is interesting to me in this time when we are all forced to be socially distant, we are all forced to be at home that our impatience could come from a place of battling our own demons by ourselves. Battling the ideas that come forth when you're left alone. And it is a hard place to recognize that those demons are not outside demons, they are within us. It's something that we have to wrestle with. And because of the everyday noise, the everyday chatter, the everyday occurrences, those demons get drowned out. But in a time where we can't go nowhere, we can't see nobody, those demons are loud and clear. <laughs> I say this because I fought them myself. They are loud and clear. <laughs> and there is no, oh, let me just go see my mom. There is no, let me just go and talk to my friends. Let me go hang out with the homies. No, 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 no. It's you and them demons for you don't know how long. <laughs> and you get to a place where at the beginning, you're like, you know what? I'm not even going to, I'm not going to give them no justification, no time of day. I got clean to do. Let me go fix that porch that's been waiting on me for 10 years. Today is that day. <laughs> Then you get to a point where you're like realizing that that list is running real short. <laughs> and you see them demons in that queue looking at you like, I, I got you. Come Tuesday, <laughs> when you ain't got nothing else, we'll be here. We'll be here and waiting as true as God is here and waiting. <laughs> and it's an interesting place to be in when you recognize that and you realize that there is no going around them demons, only through. To sit with them because they are you and you are them. And to recognize how long they've been there. And you get to asking yourself, how many people or lives have been hurt because of them demons and me not 
recognizing them in the time that I could have. How many instances do I have to say, ah, I wasn't the greatest of Christians that day? <laughs> it's tough. It really, really is. And even in my circles with my friends, I know that a lot of people are like, you've done a lot of good work. And I'm like, ah, I have. That is true. But I have those demons too. And they sit with me the same way that God sits with me because them demons are me and I am them. And until I figure out a way to reconcile with them, to allow them to be, I can't stop them from committing harm against others. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, it's that same awkwardness. Knowing that the thing that brings you joy, the thing that has helped you, whether it be your privilege, your faith, has been used to harm others. I mean, it is, it is a rough road. I'm not going to lie to you. Every Sunday that I think about church, that I think about my faith, and even some days outside of Sunday, as surprising it may sound, <laughs> um, I also recognize that the same prayers, the same source of peace enslaved people that looked like me for half a century and beyond. The same receiver of my messages of peace, the same receiver of my hopes for the future has crushed the faith of so many. And you know, here at this church, we, 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 are, we are blessed to say that, you know, God gave us free will. And it wasn't God per se but the people that believed in God that did those things. That is true. But it is our part to recognize that every time that we talk about what brings us peace may be traumatic for those who have to hear it. It is okay. It is okay to feel uncomfortable in those times because it is uncomfortable for us. Because our relationship to God is not the same relationship that those around us have to God. And it is okay to feel like, I really, really want to say our church is better. But it is good to remain silent and hear those critique and take that in. Because it's only when we choose to use emotional intelligence that we really do hear what they're talking about. And if we're about that talk that we talk and we're about that walk that we try to walk, we have to remain silent. And if we choose not to remain silent, the only words that should come out of our mouths is, yup, that was a church. Yup, that happened. Yup, we participate in that in terms of organized Christian religion. Because it's only until that we're willing to face the demons that the church has created can we really be the Christians that we would hope to be. It is not until that we look those demons in the face and go, you know what? Yep, the church has been the place that has justified manifest destiny. The church has been the place that justified slavery. The church has been the place, even unto this day, that says that missionaries are there to save those who need to be saved. Without recognizing that those who we claim to be saving may have already found the God that we always pray to. May be a different name, may have a different look. But it's only until then when we are ready to look those demons in the eyes and say that you are me and I am you, can we go past them? Can we start to do the healing 
that we've always proclaimed? Can we do the things that only God himself has made us to do? I know that I'm not asking you to do an easy task. It's not. Emotional intelligence is hard as heck because we want to be our own saviors. We want to say we're a good one. I'm not like the others. This church is a good church. It ain't like the other churches. But emotional intelligence requires us to know that that is true without having to defend ourselves. Taking those punches that we so righteously deserved. Because <laughs> let me tell you, even here in Angsworth, even here at the most liberal church that you may find in Portland. It's not always been a welcoming space. It's not always been the space of salvation. It's not always been the space that we think it is. We need to hold in our hearts the damage that those demons have run amok about and be willing to be silent when others verbally remind us how the church has failed them. Because only when we do that can we say that we are being held to account. Can we say that we are sorry? Can we say we're trying to do better? And it's totally fine. It is totally fine to do better, be better, and be sorry. It's a whole other task to see people outside the church and allow them to be outside the church and recognize that the demons that hurt them from us has made them say, I'm not going in there. And we have to be okay with that. Just as whenever we have wronged somebody and we tell the children every day, say you're sorry, apologize, Restorative justice means that the person who was harmed gets to have the power and decide where they go. They don't have to have a relationship with us. They don't have to have a relationship with God. And that is okay. Because their truth and our truth can exist in the same space. It is uncomfortable for us because we always want to spread peace because we found peace in this space and we just want to shout it on mountain high that this is a safe space. But we have to recognize and allow for those to not trust that truth. We have to also recognize that our safe space is not safe for all. There's not many places in my life where I can say that I have privilege, but one of them is my religious beliefs. And again, day in and day out, being a black queer woman, I hear all the time people saying, you worship a God that justified our lynchings. You worship a God that justified our deaths and you worship a God that has brought nothing but hell to my life. And all I can say is, yup. <laughs> because that is true. That is totally true. And in that moment, it's not my place to say that, well, that was beings using their free will, doing what they thought was right, doing what they thought was true, and not God and God themselves. It's not my place. Because that minimalizes their trauma that minimalizes their true experience. But I can thankfully say, as Pastor Lynn so eloquently put it, I was in a Mormon church <laughs> for the longest time. And I had to wrestle those demons head on at an early age, being a kid that was darker and recognizing that we sat in the back of the church because of that. 
having to be so grateful to these people with these martyr and savior complexes that said they saved us from our demons and they brought us to this magical land of freedom. Wrestling with those facts was tough. And I say it was tough because, you know, for those of you who had the blessing to know my grandfather and grandmother and my mother, you can't tell them that God ain't real. <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> Unless you're willing to say the belt or the, the buckle, you really can't tell them nothing otherwise. <laughs> and seeing those folks come to a space where black wasn't the majority, when they've lived in a space where black was for the longest time, going into a space where everything in the store was made for people that looked like you to a place where nothing is made for you. And they had to wrestle those demons and their faith was tried. Thankfully, because of this church, my grandparents got to meet people that were openly LGBTQ and see that those people were as much human as they were. Had dreams, had hopes, had children, had aspirations that reminded them of themselves. And reevaluate what they thought it meant to be Christian. It was a struggle that the family went through, but also as individuals that we all went through to recognize that we're in a space that brings us peace that have brought nothing but hell to others. And it takes our emotional intelligence to recognize that when someone says, well, y'all Christians be extra contradictory. You're like, yup, we are. Sometimes them Christians be just very hypercritical. Yup, they can be. Sometimes those Christians be hypocrites and say, yep, they can be the worst of them all and leave it at that and to just leave it there because the most important thing that we can do is be emotionally intelligent to let those know who have been hurt by the church, who've been shunned out by the church, who've been told that they're going to hell by the church, that there are Christians that are different. And the only way that we can show them that we are different is by being emotionally intelligent and wrestling those demons. Because that's, that's the thing that only we can do. No one else can do that besides us. When I made a commitment to be a member of this church in my teen years where heaven knows that sometimes I didn't even know who I was that morning. <laughs> I had to literally sit there and say, am I about to be a part of a religion that is a nothing but oppress people that are like me and look like me? Am I about to walk that road? and decide that if I am, I have to be the type of Christian that should have existed during those times, that should exist during this present day. I mean, I, it, it makes me kind of giggle so much that you know, folks here at Ainsworth who are members of Ainsworth and longtime members probably don't even tell their friends that they're a part of Ainsworth. <laughs> probably don't even tell their friends that they go to church every Sunday. <laughs> And it's so fun for me being a part of social justice and seeing folks like Reverend Cecil, Pastor Lynn, Reverend Jack when he was with us and know that they were a part of the same church as me and I them and they'd not say it out loud, but they were being Christ. They were being the Christians that we say are different. And being in that space, allowing folks to have their lived experiences, talking for those who have been silenced, 
walking for those who cannot walk and doing the things that others may not be able to do, but doing so in blessed silence, even if it's uncomfortable. Wrestling those demons that are very true and real. And it's upon all of us to recognize that although we may not think that our church, me, myself, has made those demons, we have to recognize that we belong to a group that created those demons. And it's just upon us as ever vigilant to fight those demons the same way we talk about anti-racism, the same way that we talk about transphobia, the same way that we talk about all the other isms that oppress people who are different. It takes those who are in that privileged space to fight those demons because we cannot allow those who are oppressed to be the ones that fight those demons because they didn't create them. They didn't seek those demons out. It was people that look like us, talk like us, walk like us that create those demons and only we that can defeat them. And we must do that in silence. As uncomfortable as it sounds, we may do that and we have to do that in silence. You're not much of a martyr if you're yelling about how grateful everybody else should be. When we think about the story of David and Goliath, David was out here going, hey, everybody, look at me. I took out that giant. I'm taking him out right now. Come on and look, fighting that giant, whooping his butt. <laughs> no, because the fight in front of us is the biggest thing that we have to do. We ain't got the time to talk if we're actually fighting them demons. We ain't got the time to tell people that we're in this winner take all scenario with these demons. Because if we're truly fighting those demons, we have no time for nothing else but to fight those demons. And the greatest thing about fighting those demons is they can't harm others. Not if we rise to that call. And that's what we need to do is fight those demons because every day that we don't, those demons hurt more and more people. And we have more and more to be held to account for. And it is interesting in a time like this where we have a different president who some of us may think walks closer to Jesus than the last one. <laughs> but he is still just a man a man that has been afforded so many privileges and Lord knows how many demons he has created. And it's up to us as these quote unquote Christians to use our emotional intelligence as our shield and as our saber to wrestle with these demons that other Christians have created or ourselves have created and make sure they can't harm not one more person. And when we're able to be in that space where we allow ourselves to be in that silence, to fight those demons in quiet and face them head on, can we bring the peace that we talk about to others who have not found it in church? Can we be okay hearing the critiques about Christians? Hearing the things that have been done in our Lord's name and being okay with it because we're too busy fighting these demons to say otherwise. So I'll leave you with that as your first I don't know if I call this a sermon because, you know, I, I'm not trying to get struck down where I stand. I'm going to leave you them words. <laughs> How about that? Them words to chew on during this month of black history. Because every day, as Pastor Lynn says, we make history with our actions and our inactions. 
with our words and our silence. With our peace and our chaos, we make history. And you know, as much as a lot of people try to say that when I leave this world and I'm looking at St. Peter and Jesus and God, I want to put a smile on my face and said, I did good. But guess what? <laughs> You're going to see them faces in the children around you. When they get older and they ask you, what were you doing during this time that children were in cages? What are you doing in this time when people of darker skin are gunned down and find no justice? Where were you at when things were running amok and run wry? What was you doing? And I'll say this myself, I was watching YouTube. <laughs> I was doing some other things, but I also did some good. <laughs> I also did some good. And having that emotional intelligence to be able to recognize that Sure, I could do more, but I'm not. Because I'm doing what is able of me. I'm doing to my capacity. And I have faith that others will do the same. And somehow we're gonna get to a place where we're gonna be all right. So I leave with those words. Remember your emotional intelligence as much as you remember your privilege. Because as much as we do anti-discrimination 101, where we learn that race is a social construct, it ain't no more. We made it very real. <laughs> we made it very real. As much as we understand that gender is something that people may choose, we have made that very real. As we recognize that our faith is something that we choose. It has been real and weaponized against those who don't fit in. And it is up to us to take those things, take that hammer that has been used to beat others' heads and use it to construct a safe space. Because that exactly is what privilege is, a tool that can be used to harm or to restore. There's no middle ground. So if you're not using your privilege for good, sad to say you're creating some more demons for yourself to fight. <laughs> but if you are using that tool, that privilege for good, you're constructing a space that will be safe for those who aren't even existing yet. So thank you so much for bearing with me and listening to these words. I know that it was uncomfortable at times, but that's what it means to fight our demons, especially in a time of a global pandemic where we ain't got nothing but time to look them in the eye and see that you are me and I am you. So good luck. I believe that you can do it. I have to have faith that I can do it because Lord knows I don't always feel like doing it. <laughs> but there's only so many times that we can walk that dog and clean that cat litter <laughs> before there ain't nothing else but God and them demons. And as much as it's nice to sit in the hands of the Lord, we got to fight him someday. So why not today? Thank you.
began to shout. The jail door open, they walked out. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Oh, no. 
hold on. Thank you so much, Cynthia and Marvin. We have some incredibly talented people here at Ainsworth. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your time and your talents that contribute to this church and to our community. I would also like to thank you for your generosity for the offerings that are still needed as we continue to worship during this COVID-19 pandemic. There are several ways that you can give. You can give through your bank. You can also give online at AinsworthUCC.com. You can mail in your offerings and you can also simply drop them off at the church. Thank you so, so much for your continued support. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy One, we give you thanks for the blessings of mercy and love that you have poured out upon us. We offer you ourselves and our gifts so that we may share your love with the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Fred. And now as we prepare for as we prepare for um, communion, I invite you to get into the spirit of that. And if you don't have your elements, go and get them. And I wanted to take a moment of something that I left off of the announcements, but it is in the order of worship. But the beautiful flowers that you see on the altar are flowers that were given by Shannon Hillis in memory of his mother, Elsie J. J. Hutton, in what would have been her 97th birthday. So we thank Shannon for, for the, the flowers, and he does flowers often for our altar, but these are beautiful, and thank you. And so now we remember when Jesus gathered those he loved, his followers around him, and they ate together and they celebrated together. But then he took up the bread and, and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, take this. This is my body broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And at that same meal, he poured wine into the cup and he said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for all of you. Do this also in my memory. So as we prepare for commun taking communion, we ask that these elements get blessed. So I invite you to hold your hands out on your cup and, and whatever it is, your bread or whatever it is, and let's bless it together. Oh, gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon the, the bread, the fruit of the earth and the wine, the fruit of the vine. We ask your blessing upon all who are connected at this time through communion 
as we partake of the bread and we partake of the cup, may we be reminded of the love your son Jesus gave us and gives us always. It is in his name we pray. Amen. So I invite you now to take the bread and eat it. Remembering it is the bread of life. And I invite you to drink of the cup, the cup of the new covenant that reminds us of God's love for all of us. And now let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of the bread and the cup and for the gift of memory as we remember always that your son Jesus gave his life, was killed and resurrected for us. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of love for the gift of the cup and the bread. We pray this in the name of the one who gave us all, Jesus. Amen. And now as you go into the day, go into the day celebrating, celebrate. It is Black History Month, but it's a, a month, it's a day of life. Celebrate the life that we have been given. Keep safe, distance, and masked. Stay patient, be uplifted, and know that God loves you, that Jesus walks the way with you, and the Holy Spirit fills you. Amen. We'll wait a few minutes, take a short break. Uh, I'll be back and then we will uh, break into all the